picking back up in first peter we're going to be talking about an incorruptible and undefiled inheritance that we actually have this will be in first peter chapter 1 verses 4 through 9 will be our focus this morning Previously, we were talking about the dispersion according to the foreknowledge of God in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, if you have not listened to that, it would be very advisable too, because many of our translations shift the word elect down to elect according to the foreknowledge, but that's not an appropriate translation. It is the elect strangers and the foreknowledge it relates to the dispersion that's going to happen. We talked about that. We also talked about in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the one who actually sets us apart, and the sprinkling of the blood, which purifies us and deals with our conscience. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he talks about the fact that we are born again into a living hope. We actually, as Christians, have a living hope. Begotten again to then an incorruptible and undefiled inheritance. This is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, where he talks about this. Now, incorruptible means that which cannot be corrupted. It is not possible to corrupt this part of us. Who God, who God is can't be corrupted. Yet those who reject God actually change his incorruptible glory into that of corruptible humans, because humans are corruptible. Romans chapter 1, verse 23 talks about this. They didn't find the knowledge, by the way, they didn't find the knowledge of God to be of any value to retain in their mind. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of man, or into the image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And this is where we get a lot of our so-called gods from. And these gods are just, just like men, corruptible in their nature. But yeah, that's not who God is. God is not corruptible. He does not change. When we of the church rise at the, at the trump of God, we will be raised incorruptible. At that point, we will be in a full state to where in the state in which we are in, will never ever corrupt first corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 talks about this in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed we shall be changed forever i should bring this point up here really quick for those of you who may be thinking oh as soon as i hear the trump then I'll accept Jesus. Well, number one, that you're, you're not going to get saved by accepting Jesus. You got to believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. Just so you're aware, the twinkling of an eye literally means a period in time which is not dividable. Which means we're going to hear the trump and we're going to be headed up so quickly, you're not even going to have time to recognize you heard a trumpet or anything else. There's no time there. Anyway. So if you're going to believe, believe now. Because you're not going to be able to live like the devil's child and then just before your deathbed suddenly accept Christ and get away with it all. It doesn't work that way. The incorruptibility of an object, um, of an objective and orderly spirit is very important also. Because when we keep things in their proper order, when we keep our focus correctly, we will not be shifted from that focus. So it's not going to be corrupted. It's not going to change our focus. First Peter chapter three and verse four, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible or incorruptibility of objectivity. This is objectivity of mind. I know some of our translations say meekness but understand what the word meekness actually means in, in scripture it does not mean humility we have a greek word for humility it means to have an objectivity of mind so here when he's talking about with an incorruptible objectivity of mind 
and orderly spirit doing things in a proper order, which is very precious in the sight of God. And then we come to undefiled. So it cannot be corrupted. And there's a lot of things, by the way, that, in, that relate to the fact that the salvation that we now have cannot be corrupted. And, and one of those is the fact that sin cannot corrupt us. And not, not um, the salvation aspect that we have or what is saved. Let me try that again. We are saved in our spirit. That is our rational part. When we sin, we sin from our flesh. We cannot sin from our spirit because our spirit cannot be corrupted. Which basically means if it's a rational response to who we are in Christ, we're going to live out righteously. We're not going to sin. That part cannot be corrupted. It can't be changed. But we're also in a state of being undefiled. Now, undefiled is unsoiled, free from deformed or debased nature, what it actually means. The marriage bed is undefiled, but fornication and adultery is to defile oneself. So you see that concept of defiling, being involved with something that's inappropriate. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 talks about that. Religion that is undefiled involves taking care of the orphans and widows and remaining unspotted from the world. Because the world will defile us. John chapter or James chapter 1 and verse 20, uh, 27 talks about that. Now, remember, we as Christians are not to direct love at the world system. You know, that doesn't work. The world system is going to corrupt us. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16 talks about this. It says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Should I say that again? If you're loving the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes. Now, let's actually change that to something that's a little bit more appropriate to what it says. The desires of the eyes and why do we need to change that because lust we want to put you know we want to put desires into certain categories good desires and bad desires you know there are no good desires when it comes to the things related to the to the world the desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes the pride of biological life it is not of the father but up from the world Rather, what we should be doing is showing kindness to others while we're speaking the truth. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of, the, of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the, uh, your word goodness here, by the way, in your New King James Version, is actually kindness. So it says, or do you, not, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and long suffering? not knowing that the kindness of God leads to a change of the mind or repentance. We are to use the world system, but we're not to be ones who are spotted by the world system. Okay? The world system and its methods do not belong in the church. Many churches focus on bringing in unbelievers and do not focus on the very purpose of the church, which is to what? Is to train the saints. That's the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to evangelize the neighborhood. Evangelizing comes as a result of people living out who they are in Christ. This is why scripture says we are to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts and always be ready to give a reason, a defense as to the hope that we actually have. That's not for the church. The church is for developing and growing and maturing for the saints. So we are to use the world system, but we are not to be abusing it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 31. And those who use this world as not misusing it, that is using it up to its full, for the form of this world is passing away. 
our inheritance doesn't fade away. It's incorruptible, it's undefilable, and it does not fade away. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in the heaven for you. We see this unfading concept expressed like with the crown of a pastor. The glory that is expressed from, and that remember, remember your word glory there means to have or to hold a proper opinion. So the unfading expression of a proper opinion of what a pastor has done, does it doesn't fade. The crown of a pastor doesn't fade. First Peter chapter 4 and verse uh, 5. And when the chief priest appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now he's talking there to the pastors, by the way. And a pastor who serves well will earn a crown. And it's a crown of glory, which is a proper expression of who, actually? The pastor? No, Christ. Because it's Christ working through the pastor. So this is not something to be proud of. But it is something as a pastor to know that God sees our work as valuable. And we will receive a crown that does not fade away. Our inheritance does not fade away like the rich man fades away. The rich man fades away quite quickly. James chapter 1 and verse 11 talks about this. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat then it withers the grass, its flowers fail, and its beauty appears perished. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. So just like the flowers of, of the field, which can be very beautiful, as soon as the sun rises and the heat starts to hit them, they fade away. Well, our inheritance does not. It does not fade away like this. And that's primarily because it's not based upon the wealth. Well, not primarily. It's absolutely not based upon the wealth of this world, which is continually uh, passing away. Our inheritance is permanently kept in heaven for us. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in the heavens for you. This concept of reserved is being kept. And, of course, kept focuses on protecting something that's, a, that's precious. If we actually consider Christ to be our Lord, then what he says is going to be of value to us. To abide in Christ, we keep his commandments. John chapter 15 and verse 10 talks about this. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Okay. Although we are in this world, we are actually being kept from the malignantly evil one. So we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Christ, when he prayed for us, you know that before Christ called us his own, he actually prayed for us. And, what, and in that prayer, he says, I don't want you to take them out of the world, but I want you to protect them from the malignantly evil one. John chapter 15 or 17 and verse 15. I do not pray, and your word pray here is ask. I do not ask that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And that word evil there is your malignantly evil one. That would be Satan. And by the way, we have a very solid defense against Satan if we use it. God is sanctifying our whole bodies as we, uh, as we are being kept, as we, that is our whole body, as we keep it blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 talks about this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless, that is kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Kept in a state of being without uh, blame. 
We are being guarded by the inherent ability of God through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. It's God's power that's actually guarding us, not our power. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. The ones whose God's the ones who God's natural ability is guarding through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. You know, it's God who actually guards us. So who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? What is going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, perilness, or the sword? No, none of these can actually separate us from the love of God. There is no place, there is no being, whether a human or any other kind of being, that can actually separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 36. As it is written, for your sake you are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But the reality is he will never separate from us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Our high priest cannot be corrupted, for he is separated from sinners. That is right. Christ is our high priest because he's raised from the dead. He serves as our high priest, and he cannot be corrupted by sinners. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Our high priest did not sin. The salvation that is ready to be revealed, he then talks about here. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, where here he says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. You know, what's going to happen in the last times here, and when this full revelation, when we when we actually see the full manifestation of who we are, of what God has done in relation to our salvation, where we are actually in an incorruptible state. This is going to be a time when the when the curse on the earth is going to be removed because it is when the sons of God are actually manifested. Romans chapter 8 verses 22 through 23 talks about this. For we intuitively know that all the creation groans together and together labors up to the present. Indeed, not only, but also ourselves having the first fruit of the Spirit also, we ourselves in ourselves groan, eagerly awaiting the placement of sons, the full ransom of our bodies. Because when this happens, the curse on the earth is released. The end of our faith, then, is the salvation of our souls. Right now, and, th and this is something that I think is very important for us as Christians to understand. <clears throat> We are saved in our spirit, our rational part. The rest of us is not saved yet. However, we have been given a guarantee that it will be saved. God will finish his work that he started. The first or the next thing to be saved is our physical bodies. We're going to be resurrected. And then the very last thing that is going to be saved is our souls. The end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Now, the resurrection of the body and the, and the salvation of the soul, those two are, are right next to each other. Okay, there's not going to be a long period of time in waiting. We need to have a fully resurrected body before we can actually have a fully resurrected soul. So here in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 9, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, that is the salvation of your soul. Peter then goes to talk about goes on to talk about the testing of our faith. So we have an incorruptible inheritance, cannot be defiled. It's being preserved for us in the heavens. Eventually, we will see this in a fully manifested way during the millennial kingdom when we receive the end of our of our faith. And now Peter's going to go on to talk about well the here and now because we haven't been fully redeemed yet. We're not in a full state of having been glorified. So our, our faith 
is in a point to where it can be tested and should be tested, by the way. This is testing for uh, approval here, by the way. Although we suffer for a little while, we rejoice in the salvation ready to be revealed. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 6, in which you rejoice since it is necessary for a little while to suffer in various tri uh, trials. The testing of our faith is so that it is pure. Remember, faith is taking God at his word. Faith is always based upon a promise. If our faith fails, it's because we're not basing it upon what God said. And now, to be honest with you, even though it's not a pleasant thing, I would rather go through the testing of my faith to verify that I understand things accurately than to believe something all my life and get to the end and find out it was completely false. That's what the testing of your faith is. Well, a lot of people don't want to do that. They, they want to take, well, they want to believe what they want to believe. They want to take bits and pieces of things and put it together, what makes them feel good. No, the testing of your faith should not be something that we stray away from. Because if it's true, if it's accurate, if it's according to Scripture, the testing is going to hold. It's going to prove that it's actually correct. So the testing of our faith is so that we're pure. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. In order that the approval of your faith, uh, that is the approval of your faith, should make a, let's try that one. In order that the approval of your faith, I should uh, actually read that with the next verse, because that doesn't really, in context, yeah, I don't actually have that up here. So let me jump over here real quick and get a little bit of context. Because that's in First Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. Because it really pulls the rest of it. Because um, here it's saying, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various temptations, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to the result of the praise and glory and honor of the at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's actually what it should say. We are not to fear the testing of our faith, then. James actually talks about this over in James chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, My brother, encounter it all joy when you fall into various uh, trials. Yeah, no, I don't think that's a joyful thing. But actually, if you look at it correctly, it can be a joyful thing, because what's the end result of it? The testing for approval of our faith produces patience. Okay, so when we are tempted, and that's what Peter's talking about, we're going to be tempted, that's a solicitation to do what is lacking. That will produce a faith that is approved. Because if we're taking God at his word, we're going to overcome those temptations. Well, James also talks about the fact that there are times when our faith is put to the test, but it's put to the test to see what's good in it, not what's bad. We're testing to make sure it's of value. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, James chapter 1 and verse 3. Patience then works out maturity. In verse 4. But let patience have its mature work, that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. Growing in maturity, because you're, you're patiently waiting on your faith. <laughs> purified faith is more valuable than purified gold. Now, gold can take a lot. And the more heat you put into gold, the purer it gets. Well, our faith, which is pure, is far more valuable than gold. Well, number one, it will ne it, what it produces never corrupts. First, uh, First Peter chapter one and verse seven: more precious than gold, indeed, gold having been approved by fire. Our faith is tested so that we are found to the praise, proper opinion, and honor of our Lord at His coming. First Peter chapter one and verse seven. 
so that all of this should be found unto the praise and glory and honor at, a revel at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is talking about when he actually comes to, to take us away. That is the rapture time. Although we have not seen Christ, we, we, can't, uh, we can't see him in a discernible way right now. The reality is we actually do love him. Because we've heard of what he's done, especially in relation to Christ's death and resurrection for us, and his expression of love towards us, that he gave himself for us. We can have an expression of love towards Christ, even though we haven't seen him with discernment yet. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 talks about that, whom having not seen with discernment, you love. We are rejoicing, therefore, with an inexpressible joy as a result of this. Verse 8, so 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 says, Unto whom now, not seeing with discernment, you believed, and you are rejoicing with an inexpressible joy, and having been, and being in a state of having been glorified, that's actually talking about once we're, uh, once we see him will be in a full state of having been glorified. We love Christ, remember, by doing his commandments. Now, this is doing his commandment. This is not doing the commandments of the Mosaic law. God did not give us those commandments. That's not the commandments from Christ. So if we actually love God, if we love Christ, we are going to do his commandments, not the Mosaic law. John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. First John chapter 3 verses 32 or verses 23 through 24 specifically tell us what these commandments are. Now we have them in other passages of scripture, but here we have it kind of grouped together. His commandments are to believe on the Son of God, love one another, and abide in him. Those are the commandments for the church. And if we actually love him, we're going to guard them. We're going to keep them because they're precious. And this is his commandment, that you should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Because we actually now have good desires within us. And those good desires don't come from us. They come from the Holy Spirit who now indwells us. That's how we actually know that we are in Christ. And Christ is in us. And really, if we are going to express love towards God, towards Christ specifically, towards Jesus, we're going to do his commandments. And again, that is not, thou shalt not, in relation to the Mosaic law. He says, you are to love one another, to believe him. When we keep his word, love is brought to maturity. First John chapter 2 and verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And that word perfected is brought to maturity. And by this, we know that we are in him. We show our love for God by loving the brethren, not by walking around saying that we love God. Oh, well, you know, I was listening to some modern um, singing of uh, so-called Christian songs. I was actually looking for the other day, I just wanted a little bit of music while I was doing some work, looking for some Christian music. And oh, wow, it was just, it was absolutely terrible. It wasn't expressing, it was all lip services of what it was and repetitive. You know? And I see a lot of people who want to say, oh, I love God, while uh, they're turning around and, and, and being nasty and rebuking and, and not helping other saints. Hey, we show our love to God by loving the brethren. If you do not love your brethren, you do not love God. And I don't care how much you think you love God. This is putting your faith to the test. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12 talks about this. No one has seen God at any time. You can't look back and see God with discernment. If we love one another, God abides in us and his 
and his love is then brought to maturity in us. Indifference to your fellow saint is not loving God. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother. Now, remember your word hate here means indifferent. You're indifferent towards your brother. He is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? Now, having been glorified, as Peter talks about, we're going to receive the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. This is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where he talks about this. And being in a state of having been glorified, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I have just the, the last part of verse 8 there, because really, you should remove the verse break there. Otherwise, it causes confusion. And especially in the way some of our translations do it, because they'll kind of separate it. And some of them will even put a period there, but it really, it's not a separate thought. It says, and greatly rejoicing with joy inexpressible. And then in our translation here in the new, in the NAS, it says, and full of glory literally means to be in a state of having been glorified. That's a, our uh, resurrection and then it goes on to say obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul that is when we're going to be in a state of fully resurrected that is when we're going to be in expressing an, a, a joy that is really inexpressible today we can't even can't even explain it today because of the the level of joy this is a permanent state of being glorified. That is actually what's being expressed here. Right now, again, we are saved in our spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 is one of the areas that talks about this. And here it says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one quality of spirit. It's our spirit that's connected to God right now, our rational part. At the return of Christ for the church, we will receive our resurrected bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible and we shall be changed. Once the body has been saved, the soul will be purified. And we are forever in an incorruptible and undefilable state. I was actually thinking about this. What happens at the rapture? Where would the soul be purified? There's some. There's one thing that happens just before we're presented before the Father. So we are raptured, then we go to the Bema seat, the reward seat. And at the reward seat, anything, any work that we have done that it doesn't meet up is going to be destroyed which means we are actually going to be completely pure and blameless. So not only in relation to our life today can we begin to live out this purity that we have in Christ. In the end, when we are in our full, completed state, we will be 100% purified. He's going to call us home. He's going to call us to heaven. He's going to purify us, and then he's going to present us before the Father. And we are forever going to be in that way. Now, this is important to keep in mind because Peter is now going to talk about the fact that we do have to face some suffering here on earth. There's some persecution we're going to face. You know, now, this could be, in some cases, this could be the type of persecution that is physical, that is abusive in that way. But... Peter is going to focus more on the type of abuse we tend to suffer today as Christians. And that is really rejection, blasphemy, people working against us to destroy our lives. Not so much the, the physical abuse. Because they don't, these are people who don't like us because we do things that are right. You know, this is the kind of person that when you call out their wrongdoing, will accuse you because they got in trouble. 
But it's like, I'm not the one who did this. I'm not the one who broke the law. Oh, but it's your fault I got in trouble. No, it's not. These are the kinds of people we're going to be faced with because we're among the unbelievers. That's what Peter is talking about here. So it is so important to keep in mind, we have a salvation and inheritance, as he describes it, that's not defiled. It cannot be defiled. It cannot corrupt. It is reserved in a way to where nobody can take it from us because it's reserved in the heavens by God. And yeah, for those of you who think you can lose your salvation, are you stronger than God? Because he's the one who's reserving it for us. Now, this does not mean, oh, I can go act like the devil's child. Grace means I can do whatever I want. No, grace actually teaches us to live righteously. That's what grace does. To manifest who we are in Christ. But regardless of what happens in this life, we can be secured over the fact that God, the promise that he's given to us, is reserved. And there will come a day, every day is a little bit sooner, where we will be in a full, complete state and we will always be in that fully resurrected and glorified 